lightning. Purple French tail adds a 30 inch fins, oh yeah. Oh, Palomino dashboard and doom of the twins, oh yeah. With new pistols, cokes, and shots, I can get all my rocks. You know that I ain't bragging, she's a real pussy wagon, grease lightning. Geology! Oh, yes. Geology. Yes, geology. This is Daniel Minizini, your inquisitive geology here from KPFT HD2 channel in Houston. Uh, downtown Houston, Montrose. And uh, here we say hello to the world, to Texas, everybody listening to the Mini Geology Radio Show. And uh, again, this is uh, Daniel Minizini, and today we introduce you with uh, Greece Lightning. <laughs> 40 years is its birthday. 40 years of Greece Lightning. Okay, something to do with geology, maybe? But Greece, where does it come from? Hmm, well, we'll see later on. Anyhow, today I would really like to bring you on a tour around the world looking at how geology shapes uh, the markets, uh, the economy, our jobs, and therefore it shapes also society and uh, how not the environment we will make this tour around the world with uh, Antoine Haaf uh, Antoine is a senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University he's there since 2015 and Antoine previously was a chief oil analyst at the International Energy Agency. So I'm so pleased to have with us Antoine today that is uh, connected uh, from uh, New York. Hi Antoine, are you there? Hi Daniel, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here and very good to be here. It's an honor to, to be on your show. Oh, likewise, likewise. I'm so glad uh, that uh, you accepted my invitation. Uh, it's a pity that we're not face-to-face, -face, but I really hope that we can uh, bring our audience in a tour around the world to let them really understand um, the product of geology, <coughs> how they affect uh, the market. So before uh, touching on uh, this topic, I would like you to uh, introduce yourself in the sense to explain explain us and to the audience what is the point of view that you are going to give us what is the point of view of your analysis and uh, if you will who would you represent in uh, when you present uh, this data analysis and uh, maybe also opinions uh -huh. um, well maybe it's not necessarily the easiest question but uh, my point of view is of um, spectator to the oil industry and the oil market, a lifelong spectator who's uh, looked at the market and the industry from a variety of uh, standpoints. Uh, I've worked in uh, uh, academia. Uh, I am now at Columbia University. I was in international organizations. I was uh, uh, in government at the Department of Energy, but also in consultancy and uh, on Wall Street, uh, working for brokerage house for many years uh, so uh, I I'm someone who's been looking at uh, the oil market for many years uh, decades uh, but I never cease to learn and to be surprised by it it's a, it's a market that constantly uh, changes evolves uh, along with society but also along with its own on its own rhythm uh, along with technology policy uh, economic uh, cycles uh, geopolitics. So, uh, and my work is at the intersection of all those factors. Uh, I, I, I guess if I had to describe it succinctly, I would say that I try to understand the interface between uh, technology, markets, policy, geopolitics. Uh, and I do this from a variety of perspectives, most recently looking at the inputs of uh, new uh, technologies, 
uh, in generating new data on the oil and gas markets as well as the energy markets uh, more generally. That is what we're doing here as well, trying to build bridges between uh, technical people, uh, the society at large, uh, institutions, uh, academia, industry, and uh, try the, to let uh, people understand what is the importance of uh, our dear geology that uh, produce uh, so much of um, a product that uh, we use it as energy. By the way, talking about um, energy, uh, what are we going to talk today? Which kind of energy? Is the energy uh, source uh, that derives from the hydrocarbons or something else or something more? So, you know, I really focus on the, on the oil market myself, but these days you cannot really look at oil in isolation. Uh, there's increasingly interfuel competition uh, between oil and natural gas, oil and renewables, natural gas and renewables. Um, you know, this electricity is becoming a, a, a growing share of uh, the fuel mix at the end user level. So uh, you cannot be uh, a pure oil specialist these days. If you look at the, the market, you have to look at the interplay between the various fuels and the interfuel competition and the transition towards a cleaner fuel mix or aspirations towards uh, a cleaner fuel mix. Who is uh, pushing uh, towards this uh, transition? When you say transition, I, I, I think that you may believe me what we all understand as a transition from the hydrocarbon to a, a less... Uh, a society that is less dominated by carbon a footprint, right? Yeah, I mean, you're right to question uh, what, 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 what it is that we talk about when we talk about this. It's, uh, it's a buzzword. No, we, everybody talks about the transition today, but what do we really mean by it? Sometimes it's not so clear. Uh, but, you know, basically, I think, you know, the, the, the easy answer, the, the simple answer to your question is yes, it's, it's about the uh, effort to reduce the carbon footprint, or, or maybe not just the carbon footprint, but the, the, uh, the footprint in general, the emission footprint, the particulate footprint, and uh, towards a, a cleaner environment. All right. So uh, if this is the meaning of that transition, then I would like to start talking with you about the so-called peak oil demand, because the combined forces of improving efficiency and this building pressure that we're talking about to, to reduce the carbon emissions, it is likely to cause oil demand to stop increasing. Uh, maybe after over more than 100, maybe 150 years of almost an uninterrupted growth. So uh, the question is, what yeah. is the real significance of this peak oil demand? Not peak oil supply, peak oil demand. Right. Well, you know, to me, I, I might disappoint you, but I don't really have the answer to your question. I think it's more, there's more questions than answers there. Uh, there's a lot of talk about peak demand. Uh, Ten years ago, it was peak supply. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, now, uh, peak supply has been relegated to the uh, dustbin of history, at least for the time being, and we're focusing now on peak demand. Uh, ironically, we're talking pretty much about the same numbers, the same the same ceiling, the same top in, uh, in the oil market. Uh, but what is it that we talk about peak demand? You know, uh, there's hardly a week without a new article in the, in the mainstream press about uh, a coming inflection point in oil consumption. Uh, I think there's there's many open questions. A lot of the speculation is driven by uh, expectations of EV penetration of electric vehicles uh, taking over the uh, transportation market. Uh, that's a big uh, subject that we can debate for hours. Uh, but uh, passenger vehicles are just about one quarter of the demand barrel. Uh, then you have trucks. Uh, but even if you add all the transportation, uh, there's still a lot more to the demand barrel than just transportation. Uh, you do have uh, uh, petrochemical demand. You do have uh, power generation demand. And, you know, I've worked in the data, uh, closely in data for many years. Uh, I worked in data at the U.S. Uh, Energy Information Administration. Uh, I work with data closely at the IEA. Uh, I worked in data or with data now using satellite imaging and machine learning. Uh, but I can tell you that when it comes to oil demand, uh, 
there's a lot of uncertainties about the, the, the data, about what the breakdown of demand really is. One example, power generation. Uh, typically, when we look at oil use in power generation, we really focus on uh, oil that's burned in, in big power plants. And uh, in the IEA breakdown, power generation just accounts for about 6% of, uh, of oil demand, you know, compared to 27% for passenger vehicles. But in that, in that power generation segment, it's mostly really uh, oil burnt in major power plants, in uh, you know, direct crude burn in, in Saudi Arabia or, or China or Japan. Uh, but we tend to, to miss or to, to, to uh, we, we don't really capture very well all the, the diesel that's consumed in uh, backup generators, in standalone uh, gensets in, in uh, emerging markets like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or India or Pakistan or Bangladesh or Indonesia, large markets where those units uh, really account for a significant amount of demand, but because it's so fragmented, it's so uh, diffuse, um, it's not very well captured. The, the diesel that uh, goes into those units comes out of, uh, of service stations. It tends to be counted as, as uh, diesel demand for trucking. So uh, part of what I do is to try to understand really uh, the nature of demand to, to, to get a more granular understanding of how we use oil in the market today. And based on, on that more granular understanding than uh, is uh, usually available, try to understand what the issues, what the, what the prospects might be for displacement of oil or for, or for increase in oil consumption in future. So if we don't, uh, if at some point there's going to be a peak in the uh, demand for oil, this uh, source of energy, uh, at some point it means that we're not going to need uh, that much of oil, so we are going to use another source of energy. Which is this other source of energy that we are going to use in exchange of the, uh, of the oil? Well, uh, hypothetically, if we did reduce uh, consumption of oil, it could be replaced by nothing. It could be replaced by greater efficiency, um, you know, more more efficient use of of, of energy in, uh, in in the various applications in which we use energy, or it could be uh, displaced by other hydrocarbons, uh, particularly natural gas, a, a cleaner uh, hydrocarbon source or it could be replaced by uh, renewables uh, or uh, nuclear energy um, or uh, various other other sources. Uh, Is there any particular country that is uh, leading the way for these other um, sources like nuclear or renewables? Who are they? Because when we say oil, uh, we have in mind uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Iran, and we have those countries in mind, uh, Russia, United States. What about when we talk about uh, nuclear or renewables? Right. So uh, I think generally speaking, uh, oil is the, the actively traded source of energy. Natural gas becomes increasingly uh, actively traded and, and traded in a global way with the, the, the spread of LNG. Uh, in addition to pipe gas. But when you talk about uh, renewables, it's still more uh, a source of energy that's consumed domestically. Um, not entirely, but uh, but mostly. And uh, there's not that many countries that have developed a large nuclear sector. I guess the, 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 the big ones are uh, 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 Japan, the US, uh, Western Europe, uh, uh, Russia. Um, Renewables, uh, you know, some countries depend on, on hydroelectricity to a great extent, uh, and this is uh, spread uh, around the world. Um, when it comes to wind and solar, uh, the big areas of, of, of growth have been the U.S., have been Europe, and have been China. Um, so we were talking about this peak oil demand. and If demand is lower, then prices will be lower. So at some point, they're going to be so low that they're probably are going to be lower than the cost of extraction. Uh, yeah, if you, if you model this simply, uh, you would think that, but uh, there's many scenarios you could come up with. And, uh, you know, one scenario is 
because expectations are changing and because uh, investors are becoming concerned about uh, stranded assets or are frowning on uh, hydrocarbons because they think it's a dirty source of energy, you might uh, then have um, – there's a risk that you might have underinvestment in, uh, in oil. Uh, and it, it's possible to come up with a scenario where the decline in production actually uh, runs ahead of the decline in demand and the market becomes short and then you have price spikes. And this could lead to uh, 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 suddenly displacement of oil and, and, and peak demand, but in a much more disorderly way than uh, many expect when they talk about peak demand. You know, you could have a, a scenario where you have uh, price shocks and where uh, demand shifts away from oil because of price effects, not because of a policy preference. So if uh, if if that if that occurs, so if if of course that 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 would be the end of of oil extraction. If this is true, it would be that um, many nations, depending on oil exports, they are going to be jeopardized. Is that right? Yeah, I mean you would expect expect to see winners and losers in this process, but it's not completely clear who the winners would be. Um, it, it would make sense to expect that the winners would be the, the low-cost producers. And the low-cost producers today would be particularly, uh, you know, based on what we know in existing technology and the resource base that we, we are aware of, uh, countries like Saudi Arabia in the Middle East uh, or perhaps Russia in, uh, in, in uh, you know, Eurasia. Um, but that's assuming that uh, everything goes well for those countries. And, and again, there's many scenarios that you could uh, come up with. And the thing is that uh, for countries like Saudi Arabia or other oil producers, what matters is not just the cost of production, it's also the fiscal requirement of the country, the, the social cost of production, the, the budget needs. And, uh, uh, you know, now prices are rebounding, so uh, many oil producing countries are, are breathing a little bit more easily. But when prices were low uh, in the last three years and there were growing expectations of lower for longer uh, prices, that uh, we would not see a rebound for, for uh, a long period of time, then the concern was how long could uh, exporting countries live with low prices without going through a period of uh, social turmoil or political uh, upheaval. I see. So let, let me see if I can, um, if if uh, if I demonstrate an understanding here. So uh, we are talking about the peak oil demand, uh, which is different than the peak oil supply. And the supply is what we produce today, um, roughly 96, 95 um, millions of barrels every day in the in the world. That is, that is the supply. So it seems that there is a shift in in a paradigm. So um, we move from an age uh, not not many years ago of um, perceived scarcity uh, of, the, of the source of the oil to an age of uh, abundance. So with this, uh, the market uh, will become more competitive. Uh, that means this thing to me. So in the past, with oil scarcity, the, the high-cost producers, and, and like I, I remember that UK is one of those, uh, or, or Norway maybe, where, where a, a cash cost per barrel uh, could be between 30 and 40, 45 dollars. Um, These uh, high-cost producers, they have been able to coexist uh, with the low-cost producers. And, uh, and we all know that the um, low-cost producers, they are the Saudis, uh, the first ones, whose barrel is uh, only nine dollars uh, the, the cash cost, cost of it so so these high cost producers they were living together with the low cost producers without being driven out of the market uh, because the low cost producers they have effectively um, rationed like they, they they rationed their supplies, uh, and that I think is because they were preserving them for the future, expecting the the peak oil supply when the prices would have increased. Is is this correct? That I think that's correct. I, the, what I'm not completely sure is whether the um, stated explanation, the sta stated rationalization for that policy, is really what counts. 
uh, deep down at the at the end of the day. It, it's true that there was, there has been, and there continues to be a coexistence between low cost producers and high cost producers. And in the past, the 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 uh, narrative of preserving resources for future generations uh, seemed to make sense. And it was supported by the hoteling uh, theory of uh, all resources, the, the idea of scarcity and rising prices over time. Uh, that theory has been largely, uh, for, for some time now, um, uh, debunked. Uh, we, we do find oil constantly, and uh, you know, the, the, the peak in oil production has been forecast for many, many decades and, and pushed back uh, repeatedly until uh, now we, we, we live in an age of perceived abundance. But I think... What really, what really drives this coexistence is simply the, the economic reality that low cost producers benefit from the presence of, of high cost producers because those marginal producers raise the cost of the barrel across the, across the market. So, uh, for, for the low cost producers, there's an ideal, uh, a sweet spot, an ideal market share where they can maximize their revenue uh, by leveraging the impact of the of the high cost producers on the barrel, uh, while capturing a, a large enough uh, part of the market, and I, I think you know uh, peak oil demand, the, the the idea that we live now in an age of abundance and that uh, demand is, is is bound to diminish and to oil consumption is, is bound to be displaced by uh, other sources of energy, that might change the narrative on the surface. But the incentives, the the, the, the deep, uh, the, the underlying uh, unspoken uh, economic incentives to uh, leave some room to the high cost producers remain. Okay, so Antoine, I think that we set the stage uh, about some basics, uh, and um, I would like now to do this trip around the world with you and I'd like the audience to understand better those mysterious uh, global processes that you study and you analyze uh, that, that shape our economy, our jobs, geopolitics uh, and, and the environment as, as well. So uh, I would like just to, to take off and, uh, and maybe uh, bringing you here in an airplane looking from above, looking at Texas and, and Houston where I'm based uh, where we have KPFT uh, in downtown Houston and telling us something um, about this energy hub that is Houston. What is the role of Houston, which we call the energy capital of the world, uh, mm -hmm. in the world from your uh, perspective? Do you have a global perspective? So can you go from our local Houston to the global perspective, please? Sure, sure. Well, Houston is a is a is a place whose role keeps changing in the oil market. It's been it's been a you know at the center of the of the oil market for for a long time uh, since Pedro Top and uh, you know almost since the the very beginning of the oil industry. Uh, but its its role has been changing and and keeps on changing uh, until recently. Um, the Gulf Coast was a, a large producer, but was the U.S. was an importer of uh, a large importer of uh, of oil, uh, and uh, was expected to become a large importer of uh, of gas as well. And since the shale revolution, of course, uh, things have changed dramatically, and uh, now the U.S. has become the largest uh, the largest uh, liquid producer in the world, and Houston is at the very center of, of that uh, surge in production. Um, it's, uh, you know, the U.S. has become a force in, in oil, has become a force in natural gas, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's been now, uh, since exports of crude have been liberalized, have been deregulated uh, in December 2015, uh, it's been an increasingly large exporter on a growth basis of, of crude around the world, as well as products. For a longer time, in, in, a, in an even bigger way, uh, and it's increasingly an exporter of LNG as well. Um, Houston is, you know, the center of the oil culture. Uh, I would say. I mean, it's at the risk of, of uh, recycling old cliches. Uh, it's, it's, it's really the, the, the oil capital of the U.S. and the, the oil capital in the world in many ways. Uh, but what's striking is that the you know, and Houston is a fascinating city, uh, the most cosmopolitan city in the U.S., the, the biggest melting pot, one of the fastest-growing uh, cities today. Uh, but 
what's striking is how shale has really changed the dynamics of the oil market and the perception uh, of the of the oil market. Uh, we talked about uh, moving from a perception of scarcity to a perception of abundance, and Houston is at the center of that. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, uh, strongly connected with the growth of the of the shale oil industry, uh, which brings a completely different model, business model, to the oil industry. Uh, and again, this is uh, something that's been widely discussed. Uh, so I don't want to spend too much time going over this. But uh, shale, shale companies you know, are, are very different from uh, traditional oil companies. They're typically smaller. They're more nimble. They have lower uh, capital requirements initially to, to launch the projects, but their ongoing costs are more significant. Uh, they're more uh, leveraged. They have uh, a lower, uh, a smaller uh, balance sheet, but they uh, do uh, borrow. Uh, but the shale industry, remarkably, is itself changing. So uh, just as the market got accustomed to this idea of a two-speed industry, an industry, an oil industry divided between big companies, major companies, slow-moving, deep-pocketed, uh, but with very long lead times, very conservative by nature, and on the other hand, a more nimble, uh, uh, price-sensitive shale industry. Just as we, we're becoming used to this dichotomy, uh, the shale industry, I think, has started evolving, and we're now in the second stage of the shale industry, where it's becoming, you know, it's, it's still different from the, from the mainstream, the rest of the industry, but it's becoming uh, more uh, capital intensive and a little bit slower moving and a little bit less price sensitive. Uh, I think the, 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 the more recent projects, you know, the cost benefits that have been achieved over the last few years of low prices, uh, the cost savings, the budget discipline, the improvements in efficiency have all translated into uh, economies of scale, larger projects, longer laterals, uh, the assembling, assemblage of, of leases together, uh, all this is more time consuming, takes more time, to, takes more capital initially, and uh, results in a different um, profile of growth for shale production. In the last year, I think instead of the steady incremental growth, uh, that we had seen in the early stage of the shale industry, we've seen increasingly a more lumpy uh, type of growth with some months uh, when we see uh, very steep uh, increments in, in shale output, uh, 100, 200,000 barrels a day, uh, sometimes in a single month, divided not uh, along, among many different small companies, but among two or three major companies for the most part, followed by months of much smaller growth, uh, slower growth, or even flat growth, or even small declines month on month. So when uh, the USA, United States of America, they become uh, from importers, almost uh, exporters, uh, uh, what are the geopolitical implications that you see from your analysis? Something uh, maybe related to what we see today? Yeah, um, I think it's... Uh, Suddenly, it changes the perception. It changes the, um, uh, the 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 hard power of the U.S. and the soft power of the U.S. Uh, Megan O'Sullivan, a colleague from Harvard University, recently wrote a, a book, uh, uh, Windfall, that tries to, uh, and I think succeeds in uh, uh, analyzing the uh, geopolitical and the impact of. Uh, of uh, of this windfall in, in U.S. Uh, oil and gas production, it uh, certainly it makes the U.S. less dependent on uh, on imports. Uh, it uh, makes the U.S. less vulnerable to to increases, uh, more economically resilient to run-ups in uh, in oil or energy prices. Uh, it uh, um, has uh, fostered greater integration between uh, North American markets, between the U.S. and Mexico, the U.S. and Canada. Um, it creates all kinds of uh, of trade. It, uh, it's supportive of uh, international trade uh, with the U.S. Uh, exporting widely and uh, uh, also importing as well. Uh, uh, so export, importing less on that basis, but still importing significantly. Uh, so, yeah, all kinds of uh, implications. And, uh, you know, some have said that... Uh, it made it much easier for the U.S. to uh, impose sanctions on Iran uh, during the period 
the 2012 to 2016, prior to the uh, lifting of Section 2016, uh, than uh, would have been the case uh, without uh, the benefit of uh, rising fuel production. So let's uh, move with our airplane a little bit south of the border, and in a couple of hours we land in uh, uh, Mexico, mm -hmm. the EFE, in the capital, where uh, in 2014 it has been debated the energy reform there. <clears throat> what is the meaning of this energy reform in Mexico uh, from the uh, global perspective? Well, it's, a, it's a very... It's, a, it's both very big and very small. It, it's very big because Mexico uh, nationalized its oil industry in 1938. That was a major event, uh, a landmark event in, in oil history. Uh, and uh, it took uh, it took a very long time for Mexico to to reverse this uh, this move and to allow foreign companies again in its uh, upstream sector. So the symbolic importance of of this is is very significant. Uh, I, I'm saying it's a small impact because so far. Um, Mexican production, which had been declining uh, for some time before the, the, the reform uh, got uh, off the ground, has not recovered, has not rebounded. Uh, the declining production has not been reversed and probably will not be reversed for some years uh, still. Uh, but it's important because uh, Mexico uh, enjoys uh, you know, uh, a significant resource endowment and the potential for rebound is there down the road. So I think we will see a, a recovery in, in Mexican production uh, in the next decade, uh, but it's not here today, and uh, Mexican production will continue to go down before it, it, rec it recovers. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a cyclical uh, component to the oil market, so it's, uh, uh, the, the market does go through cycles of uh, not only uh, rising and falling prices, but also for producer countries, uh, increases in resource nationalism and, and opening to foreign investors. Uh, in Mexico, the cycle has been a very long one because uh, Mexico has a, had a large endowment, and uh, when, when production started declining uh, in, in uh, the last uh, 15 years in a big way, uh, this was offset by an increase in prices. So the, 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 the uh, economic and fiscal cost of the, of the reduction in the, the drop in production was not immediately felt in, in the country. Uh, but at some point, uh, it, the, 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 the decline became unsustainable and the pressure on the government uh, uh, was such that uh, the government was able to negotiate to, 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 to build a coalition of support, to build acceptance. Uh, in the uh, in, in Parliament and to get support for for the reform and the reopening of the sector. So that's a, that's a very important uh, development. But I think what we what we learned from this experience, we are now several years into the reform, and it's it's still a it's still it's still hard work. It, it, what really I think I, I take away from the from the experience is how hard uh, it is to to reform the oil sector to reform it right. Uh, you know, Mexico has an advantage, which is that the the oil sector. Uh, is not as big as it used to be in the overall economy. It's not a pure oil export. It's not, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's not entirely or overwhelmingly dependent on its on its oil revenues. It has a very large industrial sector. It has all kinds of, you know, areas of economic activity. Uh, but the the, the 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 lesson I think the the the, uh, the lesson is you know, reform is hard. Is there any other country that they made a positive reform, or that were you? Who's the country that made uh, the best reform, uh, uh, according to you? Um, you know, uh, there's been there's been cycles in policy up and down in in, in many countries, and I think the, the poster child of um, Swings in, in policies in, in, in terms of uh, regulations and uh, governance of the oil sector uh, is probably Venezuela, but not in a good way because obviously the country is going through a major crisis today. Uh, but uh, I think when we when we look at the at the oil uh, producers uh, across the world today, uh, many will have to draw inspiration and draw lessons from the experience of Mexico because. Many countries we really have to, to reform. I, I can't really think of, a, of, a, of another country where there's been a major uh, reform of the significance and the scale uh, that uh, Mexico is experiencing today. 
but uh, and, and reform, you know, small reforms happen, happen everywhere, including in the U.S. with the opening of uh, of, of crude exports, for instance, in, in 2016. But there's many countries, there's many oil producers that today look uh, like they're broken or that they're uh, in need of repair. Uh, and this includes, uh, uh, obviously, Venezuela, which is uh, collapsing. Uh, but it includes also uh, conflict, uh, countries that are in the midst of uh, civil conflicts or that are emerging from uh, civil strife. Uh, and these, uh, you know, go from uh, Libya uh, to Syria to Yemen, uh, and even cases like Colombia, which is, you know, not uh, uh, has not uh, experienced the kind of uh, turmoil that uh, North African countries or Middle East countries have since the Arab Spring. Uh, but has just gone to uh, protracted uh, period of civil war with the FARC insurgency. Uh, now uh, Colombia has to heal the wounds of uh, this uh, protracted uh, civil conflict, and there's uh, there's uh, a healing process and uh, um, lessons to be learned and, and uh, measures to be taken there as well. What was the relationship between the FARCs and the oil reform in Colombia? Well, the FARC was active in, in places that uh, um, are host regions to, to oil developments, and now uh, that uh, peace has been made with the FARC, the oil companies are required to hire FARC, former FARC guerrillas, and they have to earn the, their license to operate in, in, uh, in uh, oil-producing regions where sometimes communities are not well disposed uh, towards them. So there's, uh, I think there's going to be a process of... Uh, rebuilding um, national cohesion, uh, trying to absorb uh, former guerrillas, and uh, earning a license to operate at the local level. Um, so that's, uh, that's going to be a learning curve. Do you see something similar uh, uh, potentially occurring in Mexico with the drug cartels? Uh, <clears throat> well, that's certainly uh, uh, something that weighs on the on, on the on the oil prospects, and I, I know that uh, some uh, some investors uh, are staying away from from some prospects in Mexico because of security issues. Um, it's not true across the board. It's obviously not uh, not affecting offshore uh, prospects in Mexico. Uh, but uh, if you look at uh, the areas across the border from the U.S. where there's a, a shared resource uh, endowment. Uh, that on paper looks very attractive. Uh, in fact, we haven't seen much development there, partly because of uh, infrastructure issues or, or water availability issues. But I think security issues also weigh heavily on the on the uh, uh, attractiveness of those uh, of those prospects. You mentioned Venezuela. We can't. Uh exclude this country and, and, and its absurd situation out of tune also with the, uh, all the uh, basilar economic parameters. Can you explain us what is going on in Venezuela? Yeah, it's hard to explain. And um, there's, there's, there's a, a, an element of, um, of mystery there of, uh, uh, of enigma uh, in the in what's happening with the oil resources, with the oil revenues, you know, it's uh, people who have been watching carefully uh, the economics and the, the, the numbers uh, of Mexico, the uh, oil revenue, the nominal oil revenue or apparent oil revenue that can be deduced from uh, the levels of production and exports, and have been looking at the, the debt and the, uh, the budget. Uh, there seems to be missing billions there, so not everything is clear uh, about the country, but. I think it's a it's a it's a it's a textbook uh, example of the resource curse. Uh, taking a step back and, and speaking about it in very general terms, uh, the the idea of the resource curse that uh, oil is not a blessing but can be a, can be a curse. Uh, there's a there's a large literature. There's a whole uh, uh, cottage industry of, uh, of books. You know, there's entire library shelves I've filled now with books about the resource curse. But the whole concept really started in Venezuela. Uh, and it's the idea that uh, when uh, governments enjoy large oil revenues, um, countries become less democratic because the governments uh, become, uh, instead of collecting taxes and providing services and being accountable to their citizens, 
they collect all revenues and they distribute the revenues, they distribute the rent, and they become unaccountable and they just uh, develop patronage uh, uh, networks. And in terms of politically, it's a negative. And in terms of uh, the economy, uh, the, the downside of, uh, of a large resource endowment in oil is that the, 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 the high oil revenues uh, causes the, the domestic currency to go up and increases imports uh, and undermine the domestic industry, the non-oil industry. And we've suddenly seen a uh, hollowing out of uh, the whole uh, industrial manufacturing, even agricultural capacity, of Venezuela, uh, Venezuela doesn't almost doesn't produce anything at home domestically anymore. Uh, during the uh, um, years of abundance, when uh, oil prices were high and revenues were coming in, uh, everything was imported. And now that uh, production has collapsed and oil prices are not not as high as they once were, uh, and even today as prices are partly rebounding, uh, Venezuela can no longer afford to, uh, to, to, to import that it had become dependent on. So the whole country is uh, in a state of collapse. It's, uh, it's an amazing story. It's the first time that uh, it's really, I think, the first example of a, of a country where the oil sector not only has uh, caused the collapse of the non-oil economy, but has reached a point where it's now self-destroying. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the fees that are run by the national company PDVSA have been in decline for now uh, quite some time. Uh, that decline is accelerating. Uh, it looks like the fees are, uh, have suffered uh, permanent damage in, in many cases. Uh, the, uh, the workforce is, is uh, leaving in droves. Uh, everything is collapsing. Uh, for a long time, that was partly offset by production from John Ventures. Uh, which kept going up uh, against the, the decline of uh, Pedivesa run fields. Uh, but since uh, about August last year, uh, those joint ventures are now also in decline. Uh, investment is no longer coming in for various reasons that we can get into if you like. Uh, but the net result is that you have a, uh, a, twin, a twin drop, a twin collapse, the collapse of the Pedivesa run fields and the decline now of the joint ventures as well. Uh, and uh, uh, in some cases, it looks like fields have suffered permanent damage. In other cases, they're more like uh, just uh, shut down or mothballed or in, in, uh, in, in a slow shutdown mode uh, with less permanent damage. But the picture is not pretty. Mysterious. <clears throat> Maybe they are exchanging their oil with loans that they have to pay back to somebody like Russia and China. <laughs> well, that's part of it. Yes, a lot of the oil has been mortgaged and now has to be paid back uh, to, to, to repay loans that have been uh, made earlier. Uh, some oil is, is sold through intermediaries. Uh, there, it's not just the quantity of the, the volumes of oil exports that uh, oil production are going down. It's also the quality. Um, and uh, uh, that makes it more difficult for Venezuela to market uh, the oil. That makes the price go down. The value of the oil goes down. And Venezuela is increasingly unable to realize the full value of the, the barrels, the few barrels that it still produces. The heavy oil, you know, uh, that used to be upgraded, uh, can no longer be upgraded because the upgrading capacity is insufficient and because the money is not there to import the diluents that are needed. Uh, so, um, uh, Venezuela is now not only producing less, uh, but is forced to discount its barrels increasingly. Is there any relationship between <clears throat> the refineries that we have here in the Gulf Coast and the lack of the heavy oil uh, produced by Venezuela that is not arriving anymore to these refineries and the decrease in the production of this heavy oil from Mexico, which is <clears throat> also another uh, product that was um, arriving to the Gulf Coast. Is there any relationship between this Two elements, Gulf Coast refineries, lack of heavy oil product, and um, the Keystone Pipeline. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a complementarity uh, between the supply from Venezuela and the processing capacity in the Gulf Coast. And indeed, uh, many of the Gulf Coast refineries uh, have built units specifically designed to run uh, heavy crude from either Venezuela or Mexico, and in uh, in both cases, production has been in decline, uh, and uh, heavy oil uh, is becoming a bit scarcer. This is partly offset by rising production, steeply rising production from Canada. But uh, uh, to bring oil from Canada to the Gulf Coast, 
uh, is of course logistically challenging. Most of the Canadian oil exports uh, go not to the Gulf Coast but to the Midwest, uh, where mi- uh, refineries have been upgraded uh, and uh, geared specifically to run those Canadian barrels. Uh, and there's uh, additional barrels that make their way uh, to the Gulf Coast, but uh, not enough to fully offset the decline in uh, in um, uh, Mexican and Venezuelan production. So we're now seeing some increases in uh, imports from uh, other places, like, uh, for instance, Iraq in particular, um, which is a partially you know, Iraqi barrels are not quite as heavy as uh, Venezuelan or, or Mexican barrels, but they they provide a bit of a, a replacement. What's the status of our other neighbor, Canada? How is Canada doing? Canada is, uh, you know, has has uh, has done great in terms of production growth. Uh, the uh, uh, there's been a, a very dramatic increase, uh, just as uh, shale oil was growing in the U.S. Unconventional uh, heavy oil that, uh, from the past sands was uh, was also increasing dramatically. Uh, but Canada is challenged logistically. It's uh, it doesn't have too many export outlets. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, uh, bound to the U.S. market as uh, almost its uh, only export outlet. Uh, it has been unable to develop pipeline capacity domestically to go to the West Coast. Uh, there's some capacity to go to the East Coast. Uh, the line nine was reversed, and there's some uh, some movement uh, domestically to the to the East Coast. But it's challenged in terms of access to markets. And uh, ultimately, it's also a challenge in terms of uh, uh, its carbon footprint, uh, the um, you know, processing, extracting and processing uh, oil from the tar sands is, uh, is an energy-intensive process, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it has a higher um, energy footprint and carbon footprint than uh, production in many or most other places. And it's frowned upon by many uh, potential customers, particularly Europe uh, at one point was very upset about uh, uh, the idea of uh, importing barrels from uh, from the Parsons. Well, let's move uh, uh, with uh, let's take a move a trans-Pacific move, uh, and we reach the the coast of uh, China. Uh, what is this new role of China, uh, or new? I mean, in the last uh, decade <laughs> uh, that has in the market that you are starting. Well, China has been uh, you know dominating the market. We tend to forget that China is a large oil producer in its own right. Uh, it, it has a significant amount of oil production. Its oil production has gone down recently during the low price period because it's a, it's a high cost production. And uh, China found it preferable to shut down some of its production and increase its imports. Uh, at least that was the case during the low price period. Now that prices are rebounding, we might see some changes in that, uh, in that pattern. Uh, but China is really important, not as a producer, but but as a as a as a consumer, as an importer of oil. It's now the largest oil importer in the world. It's a it's a big economy by uh, some measures. It's the largest economy in the world. Uh, it's suddenly bound to be the largest economy in the world by any measure uh, in the in the near future. Um, and it's a uh, but it's a it's a it's a rapidly evolving uh, consumer as well. So. In the decade, you know, from the late 90s to uh, about uh, uh, five years ago, uh, China led uh, consumption growth and import growth around the world. Uh, there were years when China really accounted for the vast majority of the incremental demand uh, for oil. Uh, but that's now changing, and the, the, the nature of the Chinese economy is evolving. China is maturing. Uh, it's uh, focusing more on domestic consumption and less on uh, export of manufacturers and uh, energy intensive uh, uh, products and uh, it's also very determined to clean up its air uh, china faces a, a very severe uh, pollution challenge it's not uh, really global warming and, and carbon emissions that are at the forefront of china's concerns it's really uh, particular emissions, sulfur emissions, the, the air quality, the water quality, the land, earth quality uh, around its territory. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, the country is now determined to uh, uh, move to a cleaner uh, uh, fuel mix or, and, and to clean up its, uh, its environment. So what that means is that uh, uh, all uh, demand growth is, is likely to slow. Um, and uh, on the other hand, China is becoming a force in renewables. It's a it's a major 
develop a, it's a major producer of uh, solar panels. It's a major producer of wind turbines. Uh, it's uh, uh, it dramatically increased the share of renewables in its own energy mix, but it's also building those sectors as, as strategic export uh, sectors. And it's now uh, focusing very uh, with great determination on uh, electric vehicles. Uh, its design policies to really speed up the pace of uh, EV penetration is on the domestic market, but it also has the ambition of developing uh, the manufacturing of electric vehicles into a major export industry and to rival uh, oil manufacturers in more advanced economies like the U.S. and Europe. What is the relationship between China and the Paris Agreement, uh, according to what you say now about China trying to clean up uh, its own air? Yeah, well, it's 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 been a party to the to the agreement. It's uh, it's signed on uh, to the agreement, and as the uh, U.S. Uh, affected to uh, take a more uh, uh, to, to disengage uh, to 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 some degree from the the Paris Agreement, to to, to withdraw from the agreement, and to disengage from the climate conversation, China has made it known that it wanted to it was ready to take the mantle of leadership from the U.S. Uh, there was a you know famous. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping, famously at uh, Davos uh, uh, a year ago, uh, made a speech saying that uh, China was ready to lead the world in the uh, in the, the fight against uh, global warming. Is this also um, a geopolitical move? Uh, well, there's a, there's a degree of posturing certainly uh, there, uh, but uh, there's also uh, uh, the perception of, uh, I'm sure, of, uh, of an economic opportunity and a political opportunity as well. And uh, what about the um, neighbor of China, which is Russia? What is the role of Russia? And we can start with the relationship that they have with China in the market. Well, uh, you're asking, you, you, this is one difficult question as another, so I'm afraid I'm, I'm answering in, in very simplistic terms. Uh, but Russia is is another very important player, but in a very different way. It's not a, it's not a large it's not a very large consumer it's all in its own right. It's uh, but it's a very large producer. And today, uh, the world of the, the the world of oil production is really dominated by three major but very different players, which are the U.S., uh, Saudi Arabia, and, and Russia. Uh, the rise in Russian production in the last few years has taken many by surprise and you know when prices collapsed in 2014 uh, the drop in, in, in oil prices coincided with uh, or quickly shortly followed the invasion of uh, Crimea by, by uh, Ukraine by Russia and the annexation of Crimea by Russia and the imposition of international sanctions on Russia in the Russian oil sector and many at that time uh, thought that Russia hit by the the, the, the the double blow of the sanctions and the collapse in prices would 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 crumble, and that Russian production would drop. And the opposite has happened. Russian production has increased dramatically. Uh, and uh, in fact, the ruble. What happened is the ruble uh, has collapsed, and. Uh, Russia's uh, production costs are, for the most part, denominated in rubles. So Russia uh, overnight became uh, one of the lowest cost producers and has been able to maintain, uh, not only to maintain production, but to increase production significantly. Uh, the ruble took another hit just recently from uh, uh, new U.S. sanctions on Russian uh, um, leaders uh, and business leaders. And uh, that's again, that's uh, uh, you know, that extends the lease on the, on further production growth for, for Russia as its production costs uh, uh, have dropped, even as oil prices internationally uh, are increasing. So Russia is a, is a large player. Russia surprised the market not just by its production growth, but by its willingness to align itself with OPEC uh, back in uh, uh, 2016 when OPEC was. Uh, after having uh, chosen in uh, 2014 not to cut production, in, in 2016, OPEC revisited that policy and decided to uh, revisit, to, to, to return to uh, supply management and to reimpose uh, production targets on its members. 
uh, OPEC reached out to non-OPEC producers uh, and uh, invited them to join in this effort to show up prices and uh, uh, limit supply. And Russia surprised everyone by not only uh, agreeing uh, to join OPEC in this, in this agreement, but in also in implementing and following up and delivering on its promises, uh, which it had not done before. There had been previous cases when Russia uh, paid lip service to OPEC agreements and said it would join, uh, but failed to do so, failed to deliver. Uh, this time it did deliver, and uh, now uh, there's uh, uh, the appearance of a growing alliance, a growing rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Russia, between two of the largest oil producers in the world. And uh, I think undoubtedly the cooperation between Russia and Saudi Arabia in the last uh, year or year and a half uh, has uh, gone a long way towards uh, allowing the market to rebalance and uh, sending the, the prices on their way to, to recovery. And uh, what is the position of OPEC uh, with respect to the unconventionals uh, that uh, revolutionized the market? Uh, what is the position of OPEC? Uh, I think OPEC uh, is watching, is watching what renewables are doing. Um, they were trying to kill it, right? Uh, well, I think you could say that it, it might be a bit of a shortcut in a, a generalization, perhaps a simplification, but I think there's some validity to that, uh, to that position. OPEC, of course, is a, is a diverse group of countries, so not all uh, OPEC countries are the same, not all uh, necessarily see eye to eye on everything. Uh, but uh, I think when OPEC, uh, led by Saudi Arabia in uh, November 2014, uh, decided not to cut production and to, to go for market share instead and to to uh, allow prices to fall further, uh, suddenly the calculation, the hope, uh, the goal uh, was not only to regain market share, but also to uh, undermine uh, the high-cost producers and to to, uh, to cause non-OPEC production or, or high-cost production to, to drop, uh, to, to decrease uh, uh, as investments became unsustainable uh, in this uh, low-price environment. Um, of course, we know now uh, that uh, it hasn't really worked out that way and uh, shared surprise by its resilience. Uh, but at the same time, uh, even though shale might have been more resilient than many expected, uh, the OPEC cuts have worked and the, the market has rebalanced, not entirely because of the supply cuts, but also because of strong demand. Uh, but whatever, whatever the very specific reasons, uh, there has been a rebalancing. So, uh, you know, perhaps it doesn't matter in the end that shale has been resilient as long as the market as a whole is, is moving in the right direction for OPEC. I don't want to forget before uh, uh, we finish the, the program about the important continent of Africa. I would like to know why it is such a continent with so rich in resources, but as a society that is suffering so much. Yes, well, that's the, you know, that's another example of resource curse and another source of uh, academic uh, treaties about uh, about uh, this uh, the, the paradox of uh, the paradox of plenty, the paradox of uh, you know enjoying large resources and, and, and having trouble coming out of poverty. Um, Africa, I think, is maybe the big, uh, in a way, the big loser. Of the market direction of the last few years, of the of the low price period, the, the, the several years of low prices that we've gone through, uh, but also uh, market concerns about long term demand, about uh, you know what we're talking about before peak demand, uh, which which has uh, I think has an inhibiting impact on on investment. Uh, many investors are concerned that you know uh, if they invest today in long term projects. Uh, by the time the projects come online, demand might not be there, and the, the projects might turn out to be not viable. So I think Africa is is uh, is a big uh, is a big victim, maybe the largest victim of this of this uh, turn of events, um, because um, uh, for various reasons, but including the fact that it still uh, lacks compared to other producing regions, it, it, it enjoys less infrastructure. Uh, there's more to build. It's uh, to develop Africa is, is, is a, is a long-term commitment, 
uh, and uh, I think there's more reluctance among investors to to commit to uh, long-term projects uh, under current uh, circumstances. Of course, you know things change, and uh, there could be rebounds. and And the the story of Africa is not entirely negative, and we've seen you know a lot of growth in some producing countries, uh, driven by other factors than the oil sector. So, a country like Nigeria has, I think, has uh, you know. Uh, Faced a lot of headwinds uh, on the on the oil side, um, but at the same time has given, in some areas, uh, perhaps not across the, the the country, it's a very vast country with a very big uh, regional contrast, but in some areas it's enjoyed you know very strong economic growth. Uh, the north, of course, uh, is is uh, struggling and is facing the Islamic uh, Islamist uh, fundamentalist opposition uh, of Boko Haram. Uh, but the, the South is, is doing great in many ways. Thank you very much, Antoine. Antoine Half was with us. This was a mini geology, and I hope to see you next time. Thank you very much. I enjoyed talking to you.